Welcome, everybody. This is uh, Citizen Diplomacy International. Uh, my name is Paul Lachelier. I'm the founder and director of Learning Life, the parent organization for Citizen Diplomacy International. Um, and uh, we have today a um, focus on city diplomacy. Um, and so uh, we will be hearing from uh, presenters uh, presenting it, kind of giving us first a broad look at the landscape of citizen diplomacy across the world, um, and then a specific example or examples of citizen diplomacy uh, from Seattle, Washington, in the United States. Um, so let's get, uh, jump right in. Um, please do introduce yourself. I should also note, um, I just want to encourage all of you um, during the presentations, the presentations will each be 15 minutes. Um, that you should write your uh, comments and questions, and questions in particular, in preparation for the discussion. We'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of um, discussion. Uh, so your, your questions in advance in the Zoom chat based on the presentations are much appreciated. Um, and I just want to remind everybody, um, for those of you who are just joining us, please, um, uh, mute yourselves um, so that there's no interference with uh, the speakers. Okay, so let's get um, started with the presentations. Um, I'm pleased that we have, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced this, Soaela Amiri, um, um, who is joining us from the University of uh, Southern California. Um, she is a senior research specialist um, at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. And we also have um, assistant professor of uh, international relations at uh, Towson University, FA7, joining us. And they're going to be talking with us about the kind of broader landscape of um, uh, city, city diplomacy um uh, based upon their recent book um so with that said um soela and efe the field is yours well, thank you so much uh let me try to share my screen uh hopefully i'll be able to do this you got please it. still let me know if you actually see Yes. Oh, okay, that that sounds perfect. Well, thank you so much again for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, I had the pleasure of joining one of your, a few of your earlier meetings, but I had to take a sabbatical and this work kind of got the best out of me. But uh, thanks for the invitation once again today. So Hela and I will be talking about uh, city diplomacy. I'll start with a brief introduction of our um, presentation. And then uh, Suhaila and I will be going back and forth, back and forth uh, as, as we move through our slides because we want to do a couple of things today. Um, first of all, we do want to establish the background on which we co-edited a book in 2020. Uh, it's called the City Diplomacy, Current Trends and Future Prospects. It was part of uh, Palgrave's Macmillan series in Global Public Diplomacy. So we want to share the background that pushed us uh, to work on that project. Then we're going to give a quick overview of uh, the book, what we have achieved in that book. Then we're moving to, let's say the conclusion paragraph of our book. We will talk about how we can advance research on city diplomacy. And uh, as it happens, both Suhaila and I have different frameworks that we use to understand uh, city diplomacy. Um, so, We'll share our own uh, frameworks as well. That being said, I'm going to pass the mic uh, to Suhaila to talk about city diplomacy, the need to connect uh, research and practice. Hello, everyone. I am very glad to be joining you all today. And FA, thank you for the great introduction. I'm Suhaila Amiri. I'm a policy researcher in the field of public diplomacy, mostly doing impact evaluation. Um, and I work mainly at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy, but I am also a policy researcher adjunct um, at RAND Corporation. And um, yes, so what um, the, the way our presentation will go today is that we're going to, um, FA will talk about um, 
current trends and future prospects of city diplomacy, something that our book also captured. And then I'll talk about uh, the state of research and how it is now and how we think it should be. This is also captured in a um, chapter that we co-authored together um, and which was, I think, published just a few months ago. Um, and then we're going to talk about frameworks for city diplomacy based on what we think would um, uh, help us move forward as we research city diplomacy. Um, yeah, with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take over uh, again. So the, the understanding is uh, we're talking about city diplomacy nowadays because mostly because of increasing urban population. We do have some forecasts, some numbers about that. We're expecting more than two thirds of human population to live in urban places by 2035. Though there has been a lack of focus, if you will, theoretically and uh, from a practice perspective on cities. Um, Akuto talks about this lack of focus as, as calling uh, cities the invisible uh, gorillas. For those of you not familiar with the concept, it comes from a psychology experiment. Uh, you have basically a video. Uh, participants are asked to watch a video of a group of people passing a basketball around. Half of those people are playing, uh, I'm sorry, wearing black t-shirts, half are wearing white t-shirts, and the participants are given one task, count the number of times the black t-shirt wearing players pass the ball to each other. Now, what's also happening in the same video is there is a person in a gorilla costume. So this person walks through all these basketball players, stops, waves at the audience, and then leaves the stage. So as all the participants are focused so much on the task, they do not see the huge gorilla costume walking across the stage. And that has been the fate of cities, if you will, in international relations. Um, from, a, from a theoretical perspective, the field of international relations has been obsessed with the role of nation states, and they have approached nation states as one unopened box. So nation states act as one actor. The idea of cities within the same nation doing their own thing, following their own agenda outside the borders of their countries was unimaginable. So that's 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 why you know they were initially called the invisible um, in gorilla cities. They've been the invisible gorillas of international relations. Now what we are realizing uh, more and more is they're actually more in between powers than invisible gorillas. And by in between powers, I do not want to steal lines from uh, Suhaila's framework. But what we're looking at here is cities are as powerful in terms of human capital, in terms of finance, financial resources resources as countries, but they're also as agile, as quick to act as nonprofits, NGOs, and community groups. So in that sense, cities became this in-between power between countries and uh, nonprofits, non-governmental organizations. The earlier examples of city diplomacy come from 1980s. It was the municipal foreign policy movement coming from the United States. Um, what we have observed in early 21st century was these cities coming together, mostly they were supported by philanthropists. So the funding was uh, by individuals or a small number of individuals. And there was still limited academic interest on what these networks of cities were trying to achieve. Uh, more often than not, uh, these networks were focused on climate change. So that was the most important imminent threat uh, to cities and the most imminent problem that required a solution. Currently, what we have in terms of city diplomacy is around 300 or so networks. Uh, they do operate in a, in a complex international environment, trying to solve a variety of problems, ranging from, again, climate change to terrorism to, uh, to, to, to migration. In the book, what we tried to do was we tried to bring a new generation of scholars and practitioners. That was our idea. We said, okay, climate change work is good. It's established. What else can we do? And we basically wanted to achieve three things. Number one was the sustained dialogue between practitioners and scholars. We do want to bridge that gap between what the theory says and what practitioners can do with what uh, theory says. Number two was 
to move beyond networking. City networks are proven. Uh, they, they work for city diplomacy. They do increase the power of cities to do something beyond uh, individual cities' power. But it's not, networking is not the only tool. Networking is not the only strategy. So we wanted to introduce more uh, to, the, to the literature. And lastly, we want to in introduce diverse uh, strategies of how cities can come together with other actors. So cities can come together with each other city networks, but what about city to country networks, city to non-governmental networks? We did have three main sections in the book. First section looked at uh, governance, and especially look at uh, we looked at the role of city networks as actors. So these networks themselves became international organizations acting with their own agendas. We looked at how cities can engage and communicate with foreign audiences, and lastly, we looked at how cities can be in uh, local, regional, and global uh, governance levels. We did have a couple of case studies. Uh, I would say most interesting one, at least for me, was uh, on, on, on Baltic states and how young democracies can use city diplomacy. So after this project was completed, um, Sahel and I uh, co-wrote a chapter on the future where we can go from here. So I'm going to go to that next slide and leave the mic back to uh, Sahela. This is the time where I would ask for the clicker to push this forward. If they are comfortable doing this, should I share my own screen? What do you um, prefer? Well, just tell me to move. In, just say next slide, I'll move. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So as we talk about researching um, city diplomacy, on city diplomacy, I want to remind us of what is at the heart of city diplomacy. Um, and it is advancing the interest of the local constituents, the international interests, the global aspirations of the local um, audiences. And at the heart of it, successful city diplomacy, it really centers on building and maintaining relationships um, and cooperation, collaboration. Um, but really that relationship building and relationship managing part is what it has in common with citizen diplomacy, with public diplomacy, and all these that um, generate soft power, which is exactly why, uh, for lack of better words, I'm using soft power, but um, but this is why we think that, and we're going to go back to it, we think that if we are to conceptualize um, a theoretical framework for city diplomacy, we can do it from the perspective of soft power, um, and that is exactly what um, what could also benefit fields like public diplomacy and citizen diplomacy and the various um, aspects of those. So what we want to urge researchers to do again is to to remember that at the at the um, at its core, city diplomacy um, is 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 really um, trying to manage uh, the international relationships that are um, built, and then the lens that would uh, lend itself, lenses that would lend itself best to this type of research. And so, similar to the challenges in the fields of public diplomacy, uh, we have uh, challenges as we want to research city diplomacy. Who are the uh, main actors? Who has the legitimacy and credibility to be um, considered and studied an actor in the field of city diplomacy? Who are the stakeholders? What are the lines between national diplomacy and city diplomacy? What's that interaction like? Um, and how is success measured? How is impact assessed? What is impact even? We, and these are challenges we have in the field of public diplomacy as well. How do we define impact and how do we go about measuring it? Same things or same challenges exist for city diplomacy. 
You guys have a, just and, so you have about you have about five minutes. Um, and how is um again um based on this? How can strategies and policies be pushed forward? So the um. So this is why uh, we want to urge everyone to remember, of course, we're uh, preaching to the choir here, is uh, the, the field that city diplomacy overlaps with a lot, um, fields like citizen diplomacy and the challenges that are similar. And so what we, uh, other than, so like this is the first thing, that, the first part of what we think research uh, should consider moving forward. Another thing is um, similarly related is the advances in technology. So we cannot think about uh, international relations. We cannot think about especially people to people exchanges, collaborations like that, um, and completely ignore um, the trends that are happening with the metaverse, with all kind of hybrid ways of connecting. Again, we're not promoting or opposing any of this. We're just saying that we cannot ignore the trends that are happening as we are thinking about the future of these type of people-to-people -people relationships and connections. Uh, we see diplomats are beginning to use this or think about ways to incorporate this and um, city diplomacy is no different. And then the third part of research that we want to um, urge the importance of is this connection between um, local and, uh, and um, international. So, um, are foreign policies set at the national level or are they set um, or can the cities and subnational actors play a role and inform um, such policies? Um, what is, how can city diplomacy be well integrated into this broader system of diplomacy, of statecraft, international affairs? And really thinking about the various actors and various um, interactions in, in, in that realm. Um, and so not ignoring the fact that subnational actors, in, in addition to uh, non-state actors, are in fact playing a role. So policies need to catch up for that. And, and that is, um, research on that is being um, undertaken, but it's still not um, enough. You have about then, two, two minutes. Just so you have about two minutes. You may want to focus less on the kind of um, conceptual and theoretical, and more on the uh, what's going on in citizen diplomacy in city diplomacy. Excuse me. So in the uh, in the in the research on city diplomacy, again, um, the the questions that are being asked um, is how can this become that interaction between national and um, international um, be um, envisioned? There are, for instance, at the Truman Center, uh, Max, my colleague Max Boucher is looking at some of that. Um, also, other colleagues are looking at um, understanding the role of networks. We do talk about this a lot, but is that really uh, how do we show that city diplomacy networks are playing a role and what? how is research being done in that front? Um, there is um, the work of Ben Luffel on that. Uh, that we can look at. But again, all of these are pretty nascent and much more needs to be um, done. And so we will, when we talk about our frameworks later, um, we urge that type of um, uh, maybe that consensus and that, um, that same approach to this study because that will that is what we think will help um, the field be pushed forward. Okay, I uh, will um, pass on the mic to you. Okay, all right. So uh, to just uh, to respect the time limits here, I'll, I'll very quickly cover uh, what's my framework, what I'm trying to come up with. I basically argue 
a cities do not exist in a void vacuum, whatever they do influences their nation states, plus their nation states actually influence what they do. And what they do can be three things. One, they can actually engage in diplomatic activities, just like a regular diplomat. They can engage in international negotiations. They can sign treaties right now to, to an extent. Um, so that's what I call rep representation. The other one is they can try to attract tourists, uh, residents, investments, so they can try to brand themselves through city branding. That's what I call reputation. And lastly, they can provide assets to their nation uh, states so that nation states can engage in representation or reputation attempts on, on their behalf. Uh, that's what I have on the on the rows here. In the columns, I have harmony and conflict, and that's the harmony or conflict between the city and the nation state. Sometimes city governments, local governments, and national governments do not agree on policy cho their choices. Sometimes they do. So depending on whether there's a harmony or conflict in between, we can talk about uh, different roles cities can take uh, in international relations. That's, that's the gist of... Uh, the framework I'm proposing. So I'm going to back, go back to yours. And if you guys could just um, uh, conclude, if you would, that would be great. Oh, you are muted, Suela. I'm going to make this very brief. Uh, the framework that I propose is that we have to think it has two par parameters. It has the functions of city diplomacy and it has the contextual factors that both affect city diplomacy, but are also used as uh, ways to identify metrics. So the functions of city diplomacy um, are the five that are listed here, trade and economic development, which has the most tangible um, uh, ways of the for its impact to be evaluated, um, is the most understood. Diplomatic representation and protocol um, is really what will help the diplomatic community uh, move forward with its practices, international exchanges, cultural ties, and aid. Again, um, citizen diplomacy practices, public diplomacy will fall under, under this category, and that's the, where the collaboration happens between the two. And civic engagement and education it is something that in the field of public diplomacy, citizen diplomacy, people are thinking about too, um, but that is how do you connect with the constituents to enhance their understanding of or appreciation for international engagement. And then there's policy uh, collaboration, advocacy and action. We see this around climate change a lot, but really it could be equity. It could be any, any kind of policies that a city or its um, host country uh, is trying to push for. Um, next slide. Um, and then the contextual categories that um, are part of this framework are um, relational, the type of anything that deals with values, policy stances, stances beliefs, identities, that kind of um, international image. Um, anything, the second category will be instrumental, anything that really refers to uh, being official, having um, the power to enact policy, to design policies, and that varies country by country uh, for cities. And then discursive would be really the geographical assets, things that are hard assets like that, but also um, access to networks and um, skilled labor. So these were the contextual factors. And so what I urge researchers to do is think about impact in these categories and then think about how these categories, what they mean for planning strategically for the five functions and how the five functions can then enhance these. So with that, I'm gonna conclude in the interest of time as well. Yeah, uh, so just to sum up, cities have been engaging in diplomacy for a long time. They're finally getting the analytical and some practical uh, attention they have deserved. And in the research parts, we're doing our best to provide the vocabulary so that we can discuss, measure, and evaluate what they're doing. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, um, Efe and Soela, um, for your presentations, giving us kind of some broader look at um, uh, city diplomacy. Um, we're switching now to a case study, essentially, or a couple of case studies 
on city diplomacy uh, related to Sister Cities International, which I imagine many of you have heard of, um, and, uh, and uh, particularly um, we're introducing here Betsy Bell and Dan Peterson, who are both from Seattle and have been involved with a um, sister city relationship with Tashkent uh, in Uzbekistan. And uh, they will be talking to us about kind of the history and the practice of uh, city diplomacy there. Uh, Betsy and Dan. Hi, I've unmuted. Betty, Betsy, you might wanna, I don't know if you've muted or not. So um, thank you for inviting us. Paul and Debbie, we really appreciate it. And um, it was interesting listening to the researchers because uh, you're talking about theoretical and how to uh, measure the impact. Um, we can talk about specific impacts as a result of our efforts in Seattle. Um, when I'm ready, Paul, could you help with the PowerPoint for me? I sent you a note to see if you could do that. Perfect. So um, first, um, what we're gonna do for our time is, uh, I'm Dan Peterson, former president of the Seattle Tashkent Sister City for a number of years. Um, and I will give a brief history about the Sister City and then show how uh, with Betsy Bell, who is my good friend and an amazing person, how Target Seattle was very active in this city. And um, I think you'll be amazed about some of the things that the city of Seattle have has accomplished. It's just, it's just amazing. We have a very progressive city and a, and a group of people who are very active. And um, the structures that exist have just dramatically um, and exponentially led to many, many things. Once you unleash the public and you set an environment where they can be supported, it is impressive what humans can do. So, um, so, uh, Paul, if you could start that part, I will talk for a few minutes and then share it uh, with Betsy. So uh, I'm gonna talk about Seattle Tashkent and our sister city relationship. It's 50 years of a remarkable friendship. Um, so I, it's not the first slide, go back to the previous uh, back, there you go. <laughs> so th this is what I'm gonna talk about. And so I'll, we'll just talk about the history of the city and then talk about how we worked with uh, the uh, tar Target Seattle and other groups. So next slide. Thanks, Paul. So um, what's amazing is that Seattle and Tashkent formed a relationship during the Cold War. We were the first Soviet American sister city, 1973, middle of the Cold War. It was a challenging time. Um, and uh, it was uh, Tashkent's the largest city in Central Asia. It's a major Islamic center. And it's a very important part of Central Asia. And then at 1991, after the Soviet Union collapsed, sovereign Uzbekistan still decided to stay a sister city with us. There were a number of other Soviet American sister cities, but they didn't continue. A few did. Um, and for our context, um, Seattle's a very progressive city with very progressive leaders. And one of the things that is important and some of the lessons that we've learned is that at times there need to be some key people in key places in government or in uh, social organizations, uh, nonprofits, et cetera. Um, for Seattle, it's a major port city. And the reason that's important is that we have always been very aware of international relations because we're such a trade dependent state. Um, so how did this relationship happen? Well, Alaska Airlines in 1969 had started tourism flights from the United States to the Soviet Union. You know, it was this exotic, mysterious place. And so they started flights and then they wanted to expand. They were originally just flying to Leningrad and into Moscow. And so Alaska Airlines invited the mayors of Sochi and Tashkent and Irkutsk to come to Seattle and meet with uh, executives here and our mayor, Mayor Wes Sulman, who was the youngest mayor in the history of the city. Um, and so they sat there and talked. And so Seattle and Tashkent both privately said, hey, would you like to be sister cities? Sure, let's see what happens. So the United, the uh, city of Seattle passed um, resolutions to form a sister city with the Soviet Union, with the city that is, um, you know, 
in what we would call at the time an enemy of the United States. Uh, the State Department did not approve it. And they went, no way. Well, there were a lot of political steps that occurred. Anyhow, the end result is they eventually approved it. I could tell you the story if it helps, but it relates to impact and research that some key people have to be there sometimes to make things happen. So in 1973, the city of Seattle and Tashkent became sister cities, and then there was a delegation that went to Tashkent and signed the documents as well. So uh, next slide. I I'm gonna move along so that we have time for questions and answers too, and, and make sure that I have saved enough time for Betsy to talk about Target Seattle. So early on, there's some lessons here that relate to how to succeed with citizen diplomacy. Um, one, Alaska Airlines was Alaska the Airlines was the catalyst. Yep, I'm starting. I got feedback. Okay, <laughs> um, and so that was important, uh, and they can be helpful. Um, it takes courageous leaders to really sometimes step up, even in the face of opposition. Opposition, and then we happen to have a lot of citizen groups that were ready to run with lots of things, and things evolved. It was just amazing. Um, uh, why Seattle? Uh, and the, I, I, one of the things I need to tell you is that we have been capturing our 50-year history in a book. I've been the lead author as long as well as with the, our, our board and other people who've been involved for long times in writing a book to capture this history because we want to share it and see the kinds of things that can happen and share those and hopefully be a catalyst for um, more, more uh, citizen diplomacy. Um, Seattle's famous for being active. Anti-war movements that Betsy will talk about, saving sites, establishing wilderness areas. We were the first state in the nation, started by three parents in Seattle, four parents, uh, for providing special education in public schools in 1971. And so things like that have happened. Um, when um, the presenters were talking about impact, I was thinking the mayor of Seattle, Mayor Nichols, uh, after the Kyoto Protocols, he got 800 cities, some of the largest cities in the state in the United States to sign onto the Kyoto Protocols, even though our government didn't. So there's lots of things that cities can do. Um, and then over the last uh, 50 years of our history, um, we've had over 100 exchanges between groups of people in nonprofits and other groups and 20 official city delegations going back and forth. And I'll mention some of those later, but um, the point I wanted to make is that there has been a lot of impact. Literally, we have impacted thousands of people in the city of Seattle and thousands of people in Uzbekistan. And it is amazing that we have been able to continue for 50 years. Uh, and it's a, it's a credit to a lot of people and and and, to me, the human spirit of wanting to be together and in peace. So I'm gonna stop for a second. And if you show the next slide, I would like to introduce Betsy Bell um, and she can say more about herself, but um, she and her husband were uh, developed this program that went on for a long time in Seattle and I participated uh, in the audience many times uh, because um, what they were doing was amazing. So Betsy, it's your turn. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, I, good morning, everyone. Um, Betsy Bell, and um, I, I went, I'm going to read a little bit from my book, Target Seattle, Preventing Nuclear War. My book is called um, Open Borders, A Personal Story of Love, Loss, and Anti-War Activism. I loved the opening talks. It was very interesting to me because what we did here in Seattle was we opposed our government. And it's, um, it's yeah, so the, the, what happened was that this, this submarine, that's taken from the newspaper, the local newspaper, showed up in our uh, waters here in the summer of 1981. And our citizenry felt the terror of living at ground zero. That's uh, around Rainier behind us. And everything that we love would be destroyed if we were actually to be the, um, the object of some Soviet bomb. So we decided to get together and um, I'm going to read from my book. The whole adventure was born one night in early winter of 1982. Don, my husband, announced he was going to a meeting at the home of one of Seattle's most engaged civic leaders to plan a local response to the doctrine of peace through strength. 
If Seattle is a target, what could we do to prevent the bombs from falling? Leaders with phys physicians for social responsibility, plowshares, the former Peace Corps volunteers, International YMCA, King Television Station, and lawyers from the progressive firm of McDonald, Hogue, and Bayless were among those gathered and ready to act. A 10-day series of educational events called Target Seattle Preventing Nuclear War came out of that meeting and the many that followed. So the organizers, organizers chose Don to chair the planning and ex execution of this 10-day program on the growing threat of nuclear war and what such a conflagration would mean for Seattle and Western Washington. Target Seattle teach-ins attracted thousands of Seattleites. It was encouraging to listen, next, next slide please, to the constructive thinking of people like Archibald Cox, Linus Pauling and Dr. Helen Caldicott, the head of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Friends of mine wrote a letter uh, in Russian and in English to asking the people in our sister city, Tashkent, to join us to work to prevent nuclear war. And the peace letter said, please, next slide. The people of Seattle and Tashkent are united through the Sister City program, through our love for our cities, and through the hopes we share for our children's futures. Yet if there is a nuclear war, all that we value would be destroyed. We must work together to create peaceful means of resolving conflicts and take steps to reduce the danger of nuclear war. 30,000 people signed these letters. They were printed on uh, eight and a half by 14 sheets of paper with 10 places for signatures. School children, people at all the events, people at the Kingdom event, which is our local um, no longer existing football stadium where the final event happened for the Target Seattle event. 20,000 people were there and that's the picture of Helena Caldicott was uh, her talking at that time. I don't see my face on it. I think it's still frozen on Dan. Maybe, okay. <laughs> Maybe you can, can pin see your me. slide, Betsy. We can okay, see the good. slide. Okay, yeah. okay. You yeah. might be able to see. You might be able to pin me. Um, be yeah. good. So, but when when the Target Seattle events ended, the committee called a meeting to decide how to get these letters to real people on the other side of the Iron Curtain. At the bottom of each one was printed the promise: This letter will be sent to Russians to Seattle's Russian sister city, Tashkent, and to the government officials of the Soviet Union and the United States. <laughs> we laughed and we talked about getting them there. We figured they'd end in a dumpster. So we decided to get on an airplane and take them ourselves. So that was a, um, a very exciting thing in our very first uh, appointment. And when we got to Moscow, each person in our group, about 30 people, had a packet full of copies of this letter. We went through the security at the airport. And uh, when we got to Moscow, we went to Yuri, Yuri Zhukov, who was the head of the Soviet Peace Committee for a meeting, simultaneous translation, very tense. And his first question was, do you speak for your government? Choosing, choosing his words very carefully, speaking slowly so the simultaneous translation could follow, Don answered, we are a group of private citizens from Seattle, Washington, en route to visit our sister city, Tashkent. Our objective is to deliver copies of a friendship letter signed by our citizens intended for the people of Tashkent. Next slide. We got to Tashkent. They did not confiscate our letters. Yuri Zhukov and the committee let us take them with us. And in Tashkent, we handed these letters out to the people in the marketplace. Uzbek and Russian workers read our letters. Each of us carried in our manila, manila envelopes our portion of the signed peace letters. We began approaching shopkeepers, children, passers-by with copies of the letter tentatively Hesitating before our advance, we watched one person after another accept the offering and stand still to read the Russian words. Our two nations must work together to create peaceful means of resolving conflicts and take steps to reduce the danger of nuclear war. And when we got you know, home- you have, you, have about, um, you have about four minutes. 
that's all I need. So um, uh, this for both of us? Yes. For both of us? Oh, oh well, I'll have to turn it back over to Dan. My gosh, thank you. Well, I want to finish your next slide too. Um, that last it. slide, okay. Oh, I thought so, you had, okay, yeah. Well, okay, the, well, the multimedia slideshow, um, to, we, I took it, we, we created a multimedia slideshow and I took it all over the United States. My goal was to increase from five to 25 Soviet bloc US sister city relations and that happened by 1989. So I don't know how many of them still exist. Dan, I'm sorry, I've taken too much of your time. It's okay. Okay, next slide, Paul. Um, so uh, let me just uh, add one other thing to Betsy's comments. Uh, so there was a lot more after these meetings. There were training sessions and meetings all over the state of Washington. Uh, and people here have uh, were very instrumental in, in the anti-war movement. And one of the things it tells me is that uh, sometimes citizen diplomats do not agree with government. And that is sometimes an important aspect for actually why we have friends in Tashkent. They knew we were not the enemy and they have never felt that way. So let me just uh, wrap up with a couple other things here. I just wanna show you an example of some of the exchanges that we've had over the last 50 years. Just look at this list. Um, a lot of them are cultural as well, arts and stuff. Alpinists, we had mountaineering experiences. We've had doctors, training doctors in Uzbekistan and, and doctors coming here. Um, uh, the dance, uh, one listed there, literally two dance groups have formed. One is the uh, Silk Road Dance Company in Washington, D.C. that started here with Laurel Gray. And now they promote Uzbek dance all over the East Coast and, and much of the United States and part of the world. So that evolves. Um, music, we literally had rock and roll uh, bands going to Uzbekistan and I mean, who wouldn't like that? Next slide. And then, so we've had all kinds of other things, organizational development and, and et cetera. Um, school exchanges, many teacher and school exchanges as the way to help uh, with citizen diplomacy, but also our overall goal is people to people contact. It literally can change the world. I, I, well, I was a principal for a long time and I always had this sentence in my head. Organizations don't talk, governments don't talk, businesses don't talk, people talk. The only way to solve problems is eventually for people to talk. So if you look at some of these things like the amputee soccer there in the middle, which is uh, interesting, um, literally there's an amputee soccer uh, organization across the world and it's still going good. And Uzbekistan has been very successful in this as well. So um, next slide. One of the things I mentioned is it's really important for us in organizations to join forces as much as we can. I well, we just highlighted Target Seattle and all that uh, Alden and Betsy did, but we have joined forces a lot with other groups. The university has been critical. We also are really helped a lot by the embassy of Uzbekistan and their diplomats when we need help, and also by the American embassy and their staff so that's also been a critical component to our success. Um, even though we has, have one of our tenets is apolitical, we try and stay out of politics as much as we can. It's not been easy at times, but by being apolitical, um, the, the people in Uzbekistan know that we are coming as citizens and we are we are able to say pretty much whatever we want to. We obviously are not difficult, but um, it's important. So I just want you to see that we've joined forces with lots of other groups. And over the years that has really helped us. So next slide. So I just wanna um, mention again that uh, we have a book that's coming out in a month and it lists uh, some of the key activities and the history and information about the sister city and how for 50 years we've been able to be successful. And so I encourage those of you interested, uh, you can go to this website and order it in about a month and um, learn a lot more about us. And uh, I guess the last thing I would say is researchers that, that as you two were talking, 
Yeah, it'd be really important to measure impact. Uh, we can see impact. And if that's part of the diet discussion, I, I've made a list of some of, some of the things that I would say is that uh, have been the impact of all that we've done. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Debbie. Great, um, uh, great presentations. Uh, thank you both. Um, thanks to all four of our presenters. Uh, this is actually one of our larger meetings in terms of participants. So we're really happy to see um, uh, the, the, um, the wide participation. If you have not introduced yourself as yet um, in the Zoom chat, uh, please do so. Um, uh, tell us where you're coming from, et cetera, and so forth. Author. And accordingly, if you have not muted yourself, um, uh, please mute yourself um, if, um, if you're not actually uh, speaking. So we are now switching to discussion. Um, and I'd like you to, to please put your comments and your questions in the Zoom chat. Part of the reason for doing this is because we do have a much wider audience, over 1,200 people from a, over something over 110 countries um, that we share this information to. Uh, the video recording of this meeting, uh, photos, as well as the Zoom chat, among other things. And so, um, so you get a wider audience in part by sharing in the Zoom chat your comments and your questions. Um, and so I want to start from the top here. Um, Actually, I think this is a question. I think I may have been the first one to ask a question. Um, so uh, to to FN Soela, so I don't know if you guys have some, I, I don't know if your book, because I have not read your book, I confess, but if, if you have some sense of the kinds of uh, major international city diplomacy associations or organizations that exist out there um, to give us some sense, uh, you can gloss over it if you'd like, or if you have a list, you can put it in the in the Zoom chat. I know that such a list exists because I've seen it before. Um, there are just a really surprising number of city diplomacy organizations out there dealing from climate change to uh, commercial activities. So if you could comment on that, um, I'd much appreciate it. Sure, so Hela, do you want to go first or do you prefer me to go first? No, go ahead. Uh, I don't know that if there's an all-inclusive list. Uh, currently, the number is a little bit over 300. That's the last number I have seen, and that's uh, based on a research done by Chicago Council. I haven't seen the actual list, uh, but uh, I saw your question in the chat, and I started typing down a couple of things that we have covered in the book and a couple of things that I had in mind. Um, for me, one of the best examples is actually Sister Cities International. Uh, they, they're an amazing network. And I would say what makes them really amazing is you have cities such as Seattle. We have mega cities such as Seattle in this network, but you also have Columbia, Maryland, which is basically a shopping mall and a couple of residences around it. So the size of the city doesn't matter. As long as people want to engage in this people-to-people -people interaction, Sister Cities International gives them a platform. Um, there's C40, the climate change one, that's that's quite big nowadays. Um, there's Global Parliament of Mayors Conferences. Uh, there's U20 Mayor Summit, which is G20's mayor version. Um, there was something called 100 Resilient Cities. I'm not sure if they're still uh, active, but it's a good example of charity-backed uh, city networks. It was Rockefeller Foundation that gave them the money to create the network. They created the network. Um, one last thing I would add is State Department finally actually has a special representative uh, for city and state diplomacy. It is very recent. Um, I don't know if the City Diplomacy Act has passed the Congress yet. It failed last time. It never made it to the votes. Uh, but there's also an act coming up. So those would be a couple of our examples uh, that came to my mind. May I comment on that? Sure, Betsy, and then Soaela. I just want to make one of the points of our sister city relationship is that it's non-governmental. So it's kind of it's interesting that they're trying to formalize a relationship as, as some sort of an overview, uh, an organization that might try to control uh, that. No, sister cities international is I, I want to say a non-profit. They're not governmental. That's all. Just <laughs> yeah, and it is a nonprofit association. Um, Soela. Yeah, I was. Um, I wanted to highlight what um at the end FA said too, which is um that 
there is an office now being created um, um, at the Department of State to focus on subnational diplomacy like this, because um, I don't think we do have um, a very comprehensive list of all organizations that are doing city diplomacy work. Um, maybe that is a sign. Uh, and um, so, Efe, you mentioned that there that I think it's the University of Chicago has a list of over 300. That 300 is actually larger than the list that I saw, maybe. Um, but if you can um, provide a link to that list, I'd much appreciate it um, because we are kind of kind of trying to keep track of the the proliferating uh, um, citizen diplomacy that's happening out there. That's really exciting. Um, so we have a a question from Moses Uyang, and I don't know if Moses, are you still here? Sam, and can you go ahead and voice, voice um, the, the, the connection is not very good, but if you could voice your, um, your um, question, yeah, your question, that would be great. Okay. Uh, this is, ah. it's already happening here. In unfortunately, um, I'm going to have to mute you because unfortunately the connection is absolutely terrible. Um, but if you could, I'll, I'll voice your um your uh your your question but if you could um just write down anything you want to add in addition and then just let us know remind us where you're calling from what uh what city and country if you would um but uh so moses's question is to dan and i think to to betsy as well which is um did uh how did your city group um navigate through government barriers in going ahead with forming a city relationship with tashkent if you could talk a little more about that Sure, good question, Moses. So um, when the mayor of Seattle proposed uh, the sister city saying, you know, I think the rhetoric between our nations about being enemies is too strong. I want to see what we can do as cities. And then he proposed it to the city council. They were a little surprised, but they went, okay. So that was an important step. Some citizens were a little surprised as well because it was the Cold War and we're supposed to be not liking each other. And then when they went further and we're gonna form it formally and the State Department stepped in, we actually, the mayor uh, had to use um, our, our head senator for the state then. He was the majority leader in the United States Senate, Senator Warren Magnuson. He was an older gentleman, and so he went, no, you guys can form a sister city. He literally called in the head of the Department of State in, for the United States government and said, we will not approve the budget for the State Department unless you let Seattle be a sister city. So it worked. He, within a week, Seattle was approved. Now, the question is, is why? So... I think our government saw there's some advantages to letting citizens of the United States go to the Soviet Union. Um, on the other side, we don't know exactly what all happened, how in Tashkent, because they were all uh, beholden to Moscow, how did the mayor of Tashkent get approval to be a sister city with Seattle? We don't exactly know. We've done research on this, and I've had people in Uzbekistan research this, so we don't exactly know, but somehow they were interested as well. The rumor is that they wanted access to come to the United States, and then also they wanted access to Boeing jets so they could have the latest technology. We don't know, but I can tell you the mayors of Tashkent, separate from their government, they have been extremely supportive all for all these years. So um, it's it's been a challenge. Sometimes the government has been a problem, but overall, like the city of Seattle for us, we are quasi-governmental. We are independent groups. We have 20 sister cities and um, we are pretty much left to uh, develop plans that make sense with each of our individual sister cities. Um, so it works. Uh, Dan, I just want to say I, I much appreciate that list of kind of all the different activities that your um, sister city group has engaged uh, in, uh, because um, in September, I think it is our, our next meeting of CDI, 
we're going to be talking about um, democratizing and localizing international relations. So those examples give us a really good um, sense of just the variety of things that can happen at a local level to kind of democratize international affairs. So really love that. Um, so uh, we have a, a point from Arnaud I just want to mention uh, to actually all of you, really. Um, he's extending it in particular to Soa, Ella, and Efe, but um, share, please. Um, I don't know, Dan, if, if you have a link as yet to the book site, um, but uh, we will certainly share when you do have a, a final announcement of it. We will share to our um, CDI bulletin, um, and we'll mention it uh, at an at upcoming meeting. Uh, but um, but for the purpose of this meeting, and then also again for our larger uh, email list, um, I don't know if Efe and Soaila, if you have um, a, a website of your own work that kind of gives a broader sense of your work, please go ahead and share that into the Zoom chat so that people can get a deeper sense of what you've uh, what you've been up to. Um, so we are going on to next questions here. Um, uh, so. Um, let me see. Hold on a second. I'm just still I'm still scrolling to. Um, I am asked. Uh, so here is um, a comment from Linda, who um, uh, is joining us from the USA, um, who says, "I was also involved in Target Seattle, and want to say that, in my humble opinion, there is so much to be learned about citizen diplomacy from the Seattle experience. So glad, Dan, and you." Um, have a, com a, a book coming out, and I encourage all to uh, also order Betsy's book, which highlights this as well. Linda, I don't know if you want to share anything further, um, any further comments. If Linda is still with us, she may not be. Okay, um, so uh, next is a comment from, uh, from Kaylee Sullivan, who's likewise joining us from the U.S., uh, my mom was living in the Soviet Union during this time, so this is a great story for me personally. Super cool how the citizens were able to create their own peace outside of government avenues. I wonder if citizen diplomacy efforts outside of the government have been and will be more effective in enacting change. In my experience and understanding, some government officials are more dismissive of citizens than others. Um, I'll add, so, so she's kind of, she's posing the question, I'll add, um, uh, she's posing a question to you about how, whether and how um, uh, these kind of citizen diplomacy efforts are more effective uh, than, than government efforts. I'll ask kind of a, a related question, which is about um, uh, the fragility. And I usually ask this question, so I, and I pose it to all of us, um, to all of you, but, um, but particularly to those um, from Seattle here, Betsy and Dan, um, which is about the fragility of citizen diplomacy, right? So there's a lot of citizen diplomacy that happens out there uh, at the subnational level. Um, it's exciting stuff. Um, but anytime governments are bent on uh, doing doing violence um, to each other um, or to their countries um, or to other countries, uh, it, those um, citizen diplomacy efforts can quickly unravel or disappear, um, just as uh, when the Soviet, as you indicated, Dan, when the Soviet Union um, collapsed, uh, a lot of these sister city relationships evaporated, not all of them. And so I, I'm wondering at the same time uh, as Kaylee's question about um, how do we overcome that kind of fragility? How do you think that that fragility can be overcome um, uh, in some way? So is that to me or to uh, or Betsy? It's, it's, Betsy, maybe you have some thoughts because you had to encounter a lot of resistance. And well, yeah. uh, only that I think it's the friendships who you develop, you develop, and the uh, the fact that we were able to establish a good internet email exchange in the early nineties, uh, so that we were we became the, the the vehicle for exchange between individual people back and forth and the the friendships were deep and they were they've uh, they've continued no matter how hard the, the relationships have been on the government level and dan you have more details about that yeah i guess what i would add is uh, the friendships part is relationships help uh, I, that's what i think betsy is saying is and i would agree um you also there's times when uh, for example we were in sister city when the soviet union invaded afghanistan and then we didn't go to the Olympics. 
And so there was a lot of questions. So luckily, why are we still a sister city with this country that invaded Afghanistan? With the invasion of Ukraine by Russia now, I know the sister city between Chicago and Moscow has been questioned. So what we, our answer is first, when, this, when some citizens are concerned, we want to listen, we want to talk, um, but we play what we try to say, we're, 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 we're the, in, in this for the long haul. Our goal is over time, maintain relationships because that's what's really necessary. And um, it's, sometimes it's been a challenge, as I said, but uh, we stay apolitical. I would also add that if we can keep finding things that is of interest to the people on the other side in our sister city, that's really important. There's times we can't go to some topics because they're just too hot. But for example, uh, one of the things we're talking about is English instruction is really important throughout the world. Uh, lots of countries want more English instruction. So for example, when we uh, were talking about doing discussions over Zoom with teachers in Uzbekistan about how to teach English, not about political science or democracy, whatever, but about how to teach English. That alone creates contacts that are important and keeps us going. Um, and so we sometimes have to change some of our focuses, but we look for things that Uzbekistan also wants and we will help support that. So um, uh, I guess I don't have a real complete answer, Paul, but it's a challenge and we have to keep being flexible. Mm -hmm. In my experience, when I was out there trying to get uh, other cities to become sister cities with Soviet bloc, their emphasis was too often on politics. They wanted they wanted to influence the politics. And uh, I said over and over again, it's not going to work. The reason we have a relationship is because we've stayed on culture and on business. Those two things have been the, the center of our relationship. And we've never deferred or detracted ourselves from that. Mm. Oh, and let me add one other thing. When I, when she said about business, you wouldn't know it, but the largest tour agency for Central Asia is based in Seattle. It's called Mere Travel. So what happened was all this contact over time, like, oh, wow. And so uh, Mere Travel then brings thousands of tourists to Uzbekistan. My, my point earlier was sometimes there's an explosion of things that naturally evolve that actually are really, really helpful that government had nothing to do with. And so, um, yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, moving on to a uh, next question we have from uh, Lucio Blanco. Um, Lucio, are you with us? <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, Lucio, if you could um, just introduce yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Uh... Yeah, good morning. Uh, good evening from Asia. Good morning to uh, to you in the U.S. Uh, so uh, I'm a where, uh, the business Lucia scholar just, here. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Where are you um, uh, calling in from? Uh, so I'm uh, originally from the Philippines, but I'm now based in Taiwan. Uh, very close neighbors. So uh, thank you again for the great presentations. Um, my question is about uh, the the impact of. Uh, you know, concerns raised about uh, foreign influence operations uh, and how does that affect the conduct of city diplomacy uh, by uh, cities and uh, whether the, the supposed uh, the concerns or risks uh, are being uh, overly played or overly politicized and how can cities try to inoculate themselves from such uh, risks? Thank you. Go oh, ahead, yeah, Dan. <laughs> you got this. Uh, um, so I'm not sure the question is, how do we inoculate ourselves from the influence of foreign companies? Or uh, could you, Gover I, I didn't quite understand. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I'll just read the question. So in recent years, concerns have been raised about NGOs and yeah. subnational tweeting arrangements like sister cities or sister states or sister provinces. Uh, arrangements like that's possibly becoming likely targets of foreign influence operations by, by go foreign governments. Are oh. such concerns put in cold water uh, in city diplomacy? Are such risks being overplayed or overly politicized? 
how can city diplomacy uh, insulate themselves from such possible risks? Thank you. And by the way, uh, um, so Moses um, from from uh, Nigeria likewise posed that question. So um, right afterwards, so. Dan. Wow, good good question, Lucio. <laughs> Our website has not been attacked that I'm aware of, <laughs> uh, but good point. Um, at this point, I don't think we've seen anything that has been uh, from foreign governments trying to negate what we're doing. Um, uh, boy, that's a good question. We'll have to think about that. Uh, I don't see anything yet, but you're right. That may at some point become a big issue for us. Um, at least our local citizens, um, and 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 we aren't seeing things even in our local media, but uh, yeah, you raised a good point. I, I'm not sure the answer. I think the answer is that we've focused entirely on cultural and business exchange. We have not been political. That's that's so we're under the radar. That nobody's after us because we're not we're not putting any, any red flags up there. Don't you think so, Dan? Yeah, but someone could still be critical of us. I yes. think that's what Lucio was saying. They could yeah, start attacking yeah. us they and could. saying, "Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that?" Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so Ella and Efe, I, I'm wondering if you guys want to chime in on this, the kind of vulnerability of um, city diplomats to uh, national government um, infiltration if they're concerned about the activities of subnational citizen diplomats. If I understood the question uh, correctly, there's also the fear of... Um, accusations of such behavior. So even though this is just an honest attempt by citizens, uh, and, um, and that's always been the case, even in public diplomacy. I mean, we can talk about the Fulbright program, for instance, it's a very non-political student exchange. Um, however, there are corners of this earth where uh, Fulbright program is seen as a very uh, Americans' uh, secret uh, people and try to change their minds. I think city diplomacy itself is the inoculation we're looking for. Like by getting people involved in these events, by letting them experience these events firsthand, uh, they'll be able to see that there's nothing sinister beyond these things. It's just the uh, people that really want to talk with other people. So, Ella? I think uh, uh, an example that I um, see as um, what and when the Ukraine uh, Russia crisis happened, is people wanting to all of a sudden politicize uh, sister cities as a way to either, um, you know, create more connections with Ukraine or cut ties with um, Russian cities, and um, and of course I have ba based on the research and um, I do have opinions there, but I but that. Um, I think a heated debate is like, is this something um, that should be used, our sister city, something that should be used as a tool in this way? Um, what is the thinking generally? And I, and I want to open this question to um, everyone too. Um, thinking, is it is sister cities, is it there to prevent um, such crisis from happening? And in times of crisis, is there a role? Is Should it be politicized? If not, how? So all of this um, is very much happening now, the debate. Mm. Uh, as, as, given that Soel is kind of opening that question up to the, the, the broader group, what, what role, um, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, Soel, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to chime in on this because there are no lack of experienced um, citizen or professional diplomats in this um, in this. A group of participants here. I'm just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on on her question. Putting you guys on the spot here, uh, or this broader broader public here. If I want to um, turn this back to Dan and Betsy, uh, maybe you have been, uh, you know, in, in situations similar to this um, approach by activists um, or government entities wanting you to take a side. Um, uh, is that has that been your experience? Um, yeah, we've been we've been put in the middle a few times. 
Um, for example, there was a situation in Uzbekistan, I think in 2003, in Andijan, in the eastern side of the country, where there were a number of people killed. And so it was in the media a lot. It was like, um, it was a, a similar to like Tiananmen Square in China. And so there were a lot of people who came to us and said, you need to stop this whole sister city um, affiliation because of what they've done. And, um, and I had some people on the board, I was president then, who did quit because they wanted us to take a stand. And I went, how do how did we survive 50 years? How do we still have rapport with Uzbekistan and all those people who we still see? We literally have thousands of friends there. And when we go to Uzbekistan, we often we're covered by the media. So the people in Uzbekistan see there are people from the United States who are friendly towards us. And so we, like I said, we, we try and keep the long-term view as people-to-people -people relationships has payoffs. Um, we did not do anything. We said it, those people who were critical and some who quit the board, as I said, we went, no, we are not political. We are here to talk about people, how to meet people's needs as best we can. But yeah, it's, it's, um, I've never had any governmental body, however, ever come to us and say, you guys need to stop doing blah, blah, blah. Never. We had uh, quite a bit of difficult uh, pushback when we went to the Soviet Union in 1983. Um, the head of the Jackson School said, you will play into the hands of the peace committee over there. You'll be used as a tool for influencing the, the, the world stage uh, on Soviet um, peace policy. And it was very hard as he, um, Dan told the story about how we got accepted uh, our visa. I don't, we did, we, our visas were very late in coming. I don't know who pulled the strings, but we almost didn't get to go because we couldn't, we couldn't get our government to give us visas. We just protested. We said, we're just going to as tourists. We have no other mission than to visit our sister city. So yes, there've been pushback. And um, I, think, I think the only solution is to remember that we're, here, we're there to befriend people and to, and to um, share our common interest in a future that is peaceful. Um, so I'm going to um, switch to um, Maritza uh, from MTA Visions had a kind of interesting uh, uh, point here at the bottom. And I'm wondering, Maritza, if you can comment on this um, uh, and, and elaborate a little further. You said um, perhaps instead of creating a formal vehicle for uh, citizen diplomacy or, or, and city diplomacy to impact kind of national and international policy, we should instead steer policymakers and diplomats to take notice uh, on this, I guess what she's saying is civil action that's happening or uh, local action that's happening and apply to their work. Maritza, I'm wondering what what is what can you give a clear sense of what what you're talking about, this kind of alternative to um, uh, empowering um, uh, city and and citizen local citizen diplomats to participate in kind of at broader levels um, in policy making. Hi, Paul. Thanks so much. Um, um, hello, everyone. My name is, as Paul mentioned, my name is Maritza Donis, and I serve as the CEO of MT Visions Global Corporate Social Responsibility Government Affairs firm based in D.C. Our international government affairs sector specializes in city and state diplomacy. So we've actually been working in this space for about seven years. And I think it was Laura that may have asked a question on given the success of citizen diplomacy and city diplomacy, is there an opportunity to maybe perhaps um, utilize that as a vehicle to influence policy? And I think it was Betsy that kind of alluded to it a little earlier when she mentioned, when she had the question about, you know, why do we have a city and state diplomacy office at the State Department? Or why do we have a city and state diplomacy act? Isn't this supposed to just be something that's non-governmental and strictly people to people? And so the suggestion that I was offering in the chat was that um, given that Citizen, citizen diplomacy and city diplomacy has been successful because it was has been largely based on genuine human interaction, notwithstanding politics or diplomacy. We'd have to be very careful to use that vehicle to then now influence policy or influence diplomacy. And if we do step into that space, 
we are becoming diplomats and we are becoming the politicians. And that's um, part of the reason why you see a lot of, well, not a lot, you see us a, a discussions around trying to create policy or bill around student state diplomacy. And it's because the politicians and diplomats want to make sure that there is no overreach and overlap. Um, and so what we've done in our firm from a consulting perspective is actually help diplomats and politicians utilize citizen diplomacy and city diplomacy tactics to help them solve the issues that they're working on. So for example, Seattle has had plenty of great you know, examples of success um, as it pertains to the Soviet and what's going on now, we've actually utilized um, some of the exchange programs as an example for diplomats to host an exchange program amongst diplomats um, so that they can, again, connect at the human level. And once you connect at the human level, it makes it much more easier for you to come to solutions. So I just want to kind of offer that as a perspective to think about. But thanks, Paul, for giving me the opportunity to offer some insights. So you're not formalizing the, the um the sister city relationships, you're just using the things that you've seen work in your own government um, relationships, dip diplomacy. Is that, do I have that correct? Um, so when we train the diplomats and the politicians, we have them use the same tactics that citizen diplomats utilize. Um, but the, the service that our firm provides is we help sister cities actually move you know, beyond the actual MOU into actualization, helping them to revamp old MOUs, especially the Soviet ones that were very successful 50 years ago. We're going back and helping to renew those um, because citizen diplomacy and civil diplomacy is actually imperative, especially at times of crises when the government to the government or the diplomatic organizations are at a standstill. The citizens are the ones time and time again that are helping to, to find leverage and find peace okay. and comfort. Uh, so just to kind of clarify, hopefully that was helpful, Betsy. Yeah, well, one of the things I've been trying to, I've been promoting without taking a lot of action, to tell you the truth, is tourism into North Korea. And we have a very active group here who's trying to set up a sister city relationship in Iran. And the Iranian people uh, that are connected with the American, the, the Seattle people, are working behind the scenes to keep that relationship going. Our government has not approved it, but it's uh, it's actually functioning at the verbal, you know, email level at some. Um, and there's so this is we're we're keeping on with this um, sister city idea even when our governments are really putting the kibosh on any activity. Um, so we need to close our discussion down. I'm glad that this discussion has been kind of stimulating. I do want to leave some time for Debbie in part because Debbie is leaving us as vice chair of um, uh, wow. Citizen Diplomacy International. And uh, um, so I want to leave her some time. Uh, so go ahead, Debbie. <clears throat> oh, you're going to have to unmute. Oh my goodness, um, the four presenters um, are are well known to me and I, I just, this, this session has been especially, um, you know, uh, oh, it's an especially warm one and, and, a, and a significant one for me. And I wanna, I wanna thank the four of you deeply and I will keep thanking you and probably you'll get sick with me thanking you. Uh, but anyway, uh, I just started to, to, to make a, a quick segue. I, um, I did want to just observe that the kinds of dialogue and relationship building that you know you talk about in your research, FA and Sohela, and that and you know from your own practice and, and your your lives as I dare say, citizen diplomats yourself, um, yourselves, um, and and hearing Betsy's and Dan's experiences, um, and you know they have some unique, um, special, professional backgrounds too, um, bringing skills to the table that a lot of us don't have, um, and then if we look at professional diplomats, some of whom may still be in the Zoom. You know, what what goes on behind the scenes? It, it, the diplomats and the the officials want to do the same 
relationship maintenance that the citizen diplomats want to do. And so I think that that is a mutual trait and a mutual interest. And that's what gives me hope. Good. Those bonds, that, that social power. Great. Um, so I just wanted to, to thank everybody and I'll still be coming to these as, as often as I can. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to stay involved in my own community with Sister Cities. Um, and um, I did a little blog about that Paul was kind enough to post and uh, you know, we, we need to celebrate our, our third anniversary of this organization. And uh, I, I tried to do that. And FA and um, Dan and Sohela and uh, Betsy will now be on that honor roll of presenters who are top <laughs> on 30. Thank you all. Great, I'm just about to post um, to the Zoom chat um, in a moment. Um, Debbie's um, blog post kind of reflecting on the last three years of uh, the Citizen, Citizen Diplomacy International. She kind of she kindly kind of created a, a list of all the presentations and links to the speakers and so on. So you can get a sense of kind of the history of these presentations that have occurred. Um, and everything is accessible. I also posted that we have a YouTube channel. We have a, um, a LinkedIn group, a Facebook group. Um, so you are more than welcome and encouraged to join these. They're all uh, now listed in the Zoom chat. I just posted those. Um, but I want to um, leave some time here at the end. And I'm sorry we don't have that much time, but I want to give uh, Brian, who is the co-editor of our Citizen of CDI Bulletin, um, a little time to kind of go over the, 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 the latest issue of our CDI Bulletin, which comes out with every meeting of, of this quarterly meeting of CDI. Uh, so I'll share my screen and show it, and uh, Brian, you can you can explain. And I I also just want to mention that I'm really glad to have Brian on board. Um, he's knowledgeable. He's a good writer. It's it's just uh, it's great to it's great to have him uh, as a co-editor. Brian, thank you, Paula. I suppose it's always good to hear that you're you're an intelligent person, <laughs> and you can write a sentence or two. Um, but no, I will just take a very brief moment. I would first say thank you. These were, in fact, inspirational presentations. And um, I think that um, it just very quickly, it, re it recalled to mind, you said the invisible um, gorilla. It, it, the invisible gorilla. Well, I this is a family story. In fact, there was a, a children's book called Invisible Alligators. It's this very sort of obscure internet children's author but in any case it's about all the little things that happen without children doing them and they just sort of wondering you know how do all these things around you get done and the the child learns that it's actually invisible alligators well i was seeing that as, as a very interesting analogy to what all of the citizens of the world are doing and all of these organizations that are that are functioning completely out of out of the the spotlight and and what a tremendous work just gets done by people who are not seeking attention and it all just uh it, it's amazing how these citizen society or these civil society citizen groups uh, get so much done and uh so little credit so i would say thank you to all of you for for doing that um and essentially uh I could also echo some, most of the organizations that um, F.A. mentioned earlier are in this, uh, this front page here of the bulletin. Um, that's all focused on the G20 and that's coming up in the big meetings there. And then the, the organizations, the special, special engagement groups within the G20, including Urban 20. And then this is the the actual work here that's been done since October with the appointment of this subnational diplomat, the representative for city and state diplomacy, uh, Nina Hashigi, and I misspelled it there, my apologies. Um, in any case, that's uh, that's the sort of broad, broad view. Uh, and then there's all kinds of other little interesting happenings in city diplomacy on the next page. Uh, people are getting together, cities are talking, they're having big meetings, 
Uh, they're they're focused on all the sort of impact issues of the day in terms of investment and global health and um, climate issues. Uh, there's um, and it's and it is pretty global. There's there's things happening uh, all over the world, uh, but you can see some of those um, connections that are being made with other organizations as well. Um, and then lots of wonderful articles and a few interesting books. I would highlight one of those books if I could, Paul. It's this forest diplomacy. I mean, there's a lot of sort of big idea books in here. Um, but this one I think was interesting to me because it has a practical pedagogical aspect to it. It's a, it's essentially a, a role-playing game that gets done in higher education settings. And it actually sort of gets you going in the actual diplomatic sort of protocols and how all these things happen. And then also the different subnational groups, religious groups, these kinds of things get involved and in how all the different stakeholders you have to negotiate with, uh, you know, at differing levels of representation in your own uh, sort of from your own perspective. So I think that's a, an interesting one. And then also the personal stories. I think that's something I've taken away from, from this, uh, especially the Sister Cities stuff is uh, how, you know, what's it like being on, on the front lines for 50 years of this work, you know, and how career diplomats. So I would point people to the, this last one here, the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. They have a whole archive of oral histories that you can learn from people who have been, you know, just now, you know, doing diplomacy at the official level. But I think there's, I mean, there's just so much material there that's that's good for everybody in the field. So um, that's sort of the just a quick quick take. Great. But, uh, Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks, Brian. Um, um, by all means, is there, are there anybody that have quick quick announcements or things that are coming up um, in your own citizen diplomacy work? Uh, Masom, who I think is joining us, I can't remember from where. Masom, go ahead. Oh, uh, I don't think um, that um, that uh, Masom can hear us. Um, anybody else who um, has any announcements of citizen diplomacy work? All right. If if no one else does, um, I do want to do one last thing, uh, which is to um, take a photo of everybody. Um, so for those of you who can turn on your um, your cameras, and for those of you who want to kind of quaff your hair, um, please do so before I uh, before I say one, two, three, smile. So hold on a second. Uh, I'm going to take um, uh, put the screenshot in the right. Turn it on. And Zara, um, uh, uh, Maritza, if you can turn on your cameras, that would be great, just briefly. On three, one, two, three, smile. Fantastic. I'm going to take one other shot. Um, hold on a second. If you could, um, uh, Camilo, Sephora, Sharif, um, Zara, uh, Maritza, can you, if you can turn on your cameras, I'd appreciate it. Uh, on three, one, two, three, smile. Fantastic. All right, everybody. I want to thank our presenters above all, um, Efe and Soaila and Dan and Betsy uh, for your really interesting presentations uh, on this kind of burgeoning field or uh, ever-growing field of city diplomacy. Um, I also want to remind you uh, that... Um, we have a meeting in, in September uh, focused on localizing and democratizing uh, citizen diplomacy. Um, and I'm about to post here in the Zoom chat um, all of the meetings that we've had and will be having this year. Uh, they are right there. So, um, so the, the precise dates and times are all listed here. You'll get this um, via email. Uh, and if you have anybody that you think should be joining the email list, um, to get these notices, by all means, uh, contact me, um, and I will happily add them to the list. So September 6th,
democratizing and localizing international relations uh, and, and December 5th on digital diplomacy. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.